I need some traction. You need some traction. Hey folks, Lloyd Lobo here, co-founder of Boast AI and Traction. Today's Traction webinar is brought to you by Boast AI Launch Academy in partnership with Van Heck. Super excited for today's session. As you're joining, introduce yourself. Tell us where you're tuning in from and what you're looking to get out of this session. And if you have any questions, type them in the chat and we'll take them as we go along or at the end. I'm tuning in from Dubai after being in the Bay Area, settling between the Bay Area and Austin for many years. Oops. I recently moved to Dubai last week and <laughs> super excited to be in this unknown place, but uh, taking the bull by its horns. And fantastic topic here today. So a couple of weeks ago, we had a great conference in Vancouver. And one of the speakers there was Bessemer Ventures. They recently put out a report that said companies should stop chasing unicorn valuations. 100 million in recurring revenue is the true mark of an exceptional startup. But scaling to 100 million and beyond is not easy. Only a few companies have done it, right? If you look at it last year, there were 510 unicorns minted. And out of that, probably less than 50 companies have um, 100 million in revenue. So it's a very tough and rare thing, thing to do. And so super excited here because our guest today is Lisa Edwards. She's the president and CEO of Diligent, which is the largest governance, risk, and compliance SaaS software serving 23,000 plus companies around the world. The company has more than 500 million in revenue, worth more than 7 billion. And prior to Diligent, she was the EVP of strategic business at Salesforce. She's held leadership positions at Visa and KnowledgeX, and also co-founded Value Bond prior to the company's acquisition by Knight Capital. So a lot of accolades, great backstory, super successful career. Lisa, thanks for joining us. Where are you tuning in from? Yeah, my pleasure. I'm here in California, in Northern California, where it is a little bit cloudy and cold today. Oh, August. August usually in Northern California is a little cold, but it's going to warm up September, October. Awesome. You've had a super successful career. Give us your backstory, highlights. How did you get to where you are today? What are some experiences that prove fundamental in your development as a leader? Yeah, you know, I grew up out here in Silicon Valley. My dad was a lifer at IBM and uh uh, for those of you who know the Bay Area well, uh, he was at the Almaden facility down in uh, in South San Jose for pretty much my whole life. So I grew up sort of exposed to technology and comfortable with technology. Uh, went to school locally, so I went to Stanford. Um, and then out of Stanford, I wanted to work internationally. Um, and uh, I, I, uh, I have an Irish passport. Um, so my thought was I was going to go to Europe. And then my company opened a Mexico City office. So I was off to Mexico City. Uh, so I spent three years in Mexico City um, and then went to Harvard Business School. Um, and then out of Harvard, I, I, I looked at technology firms. I actually had worked at Microsoft my summer and had an offer from them. I had an offer from Dell. Um, and I decided to go to Bain and do strategy consulting because it was kind of a way to play the field a little bit longer and not uh, not make a real decision uh, because Bain was actually doing work in, in, uh, in both of those companies. So I did that for a number of years and then um, kind of started on what I would call sort of my entrepreneurial phase. Um, I moved to Atlanta, Georgia to be CEO of a startup software company and uh, ran that for a, a little bit of time before I went to the board and said, you know, um, we have more of a feature than a product here. And if we are honest with ourselves, we either need to raise more money and uh, and build or buy the other components and have a full full product set, um, or we need to go partner. Um, if we if we partner, though, we should all be aware that uh, you know the probability is that they, that somebody else will want to buy us to, for the same reason that we would want to build out our feature set. And we ended up partnering with IBM in that case, and sure enough, uh, they did uh, come to us and say, "Hey, we just want to buy." you. Um, so I, uh, with some irony, 
sold the company to IBM after making fun of my dad for being a lifer at IBM, uh, sold the company at IBM and um, took a job doing the transition as a part of the deal. I had to work for IBM for a year and uh, and help get the products integrated. So um, that was actually more fun than I imagined. I was, uh, I, I called it the, uh, the mother of uh, the island of misfit toys. I had about 10 products in the database group that they didn't quite know what to do with. And I had a development team in Berlin, in Germany and another development team in San Jose where my dad had worked for years. Um, my bosses were in New York, I was in Atlanta and I was kind of doing this around the world thing. Um, but, but then I got approached by a guy in Atlanta um, who was an acquaintance of mine. And he said, hey, I've got this idea for a company and we really dug into it and decided to start it. That was in exchange for fixed income securities. So that was back when, um, you know, things like Cantor Fitzgerald were, um, you know, in the institutional side of the bond trading business and kind of a household name, but there was no retail trading and it was very bespoke and very manual. It was literally, um, you know, fax machines and phone calls that uh, that underlie were the underlying sort of technology of the bond market at the time. So started the fintech company, built that up, sold it to Knight Capital. And then I moved out to California uh, with the intent of taking some time off. Um, but I started doing a consulting gig for Visa and um, ended up at Visa for seven years. I started in the finance side of the business um, and kind of worked my way up to have a corporate services role where I had sort of all of the, I like to call it the armpit of finance with no, um, with, with no disrespect to finance functions, like if finance operations is super important, but I had sort of like the, the non-sexy uh, bit of finance. Um, and then I moved over to the product side of the business and, I uh, I was running business development, um, really more partnerships and alliances and uh, our IP strategy. Um, so I did that. Uh, and then I got the call from Salesforce and they said, hey, do you want to come do finance operations for us? And I said, no way, no how. Not moving backwards. I've done that job. I'm good. It's like Visa was a bigger company. It was growing at 20%. We'd had the largest IPO uh, in U.S. history. Um, you know, we uh, we were just crushing it. And uh, they said, "Well, just come meet the CFO." So I went and met the CFO, and I just loved. Uh, the guy's name was Graham Smith at the time, and I said, "You know, I could learn from this guy. I'm going to go do it." So I uh, I went to this unknown software company in San Francisco called Salesforce. Uh, and uh, and started there. Um, you know, when I joined Salesforce, it wasn't really unknown, but it was not big. It was a $3 billion uh, company uh, and it was 8,500 people. And, you know, leaving from Visa, that was actually kind of going to a small company. Um, and then, uh, you know, when I left, uh, well, I, so I, I did kind of a similar trajectory at Salesforce. I started on finance operations. The role got bigger and bigger and bigger. Then I got the call from Keith Block, who went on to be co-CEO of Salesforce. And Keith said, hey, come over and run operations for me. So I did that. When he got the co-CEO role, he gave me five of his direct reports. So by the time I left, I had around 3,500 employees under me. I had uh, everything from go-to-market to the CIO to partners and alliances, the ISVs, enablement, um, you know, kind of you name it, Office of Innovation. Um, and, uh, and, and that was kind of where I was at Salesforce. And then, you know, pandemic hits and uh, he left for last years and I sort of took a step back and said, like, well, yeah, what do I want to do? Do I want to do one more operating role? Uh, and that's when the, uh, the when the diligent call came. And initially I said no, uh, because I didn't want to move to New York and the company was based out of New York. And then they called me back a couple months later and said, well, you know, like this whole pandemic thing has taught us that you don't really have to be in New York. Um, if, if you don't want to, like, let's keep talking. And I said, OK. Um, so ultimately, I ended up at Diligent, which, as you said, is the, you know, I think I call it the largest software company that no one's ever heard of. We are, um, you know, a. Uh, a, a fairly large company. Um, we have around 1,100 people around the world. Um, as you said, uh, over 500 million on the top line. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I think it's 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 a market changing uh, company in the sense of I think it will be a generational software company. I truly believe that 
uh, GRC will go the way of all the other, you know, sort of uh, three letter acronyms of enterprise software of ERP and CRM and be sort of a critical foundational component of most companies uh, approach to you know, managing their business. Fantastic intro, bio, background. I love your journey. Tell us about Diligent. What is GRC? It's a little mouthful, all right? Yeah. Governance, risk, and compliance. What is it and how does it create impact in the world? Yeah. You know, I, well, I remind people that nobody knew what CRM was either. Like when we were at Salesforce, we took out, our, you know, we had CRM ads and then we realized that no one knew what it meant. And, uh, uh, and you know, I think that people are pretty, pretty, you know, today they, they understand sales, sales service, commerce, marketing, uh, it all goes together and, and, and comes together to address, um, you know, a set of customers and adjacencies that make sense in the same way governance, risk and compliance is things like, audit and, and SOX and ESG and third-party risk management and uh, enterprise risk management and uh, ESG increasingly as ESG has components of regulatory and compliance to it um, with some of the proposed regulations um, that have come out from the SEC. And, um, and those things fit together in a really interesting way to say, you know, the, the, the um, you know, your your risk profile should take into account your third party risk um, and your um, your socks, um, you know, for, for, for the company you know, out there that people that are in large companies, it is a major pain in the can when, you know, the, the internal audit team comes and asks for a bunch of of uh, you know, kind of proof points, and then a week later, the SOX team comes and asks for a bunch of proof points, and then like something else happens. So, sort of saying, how do we get our arms around all of this data, and then how do we think about um, you know the using? It really is kind of the last bastion of of undigitally transformed areas of the business, in the sense of like literally people handing over thumb drives to their auditors, saying like, here's all the contracts you asked for. So, how do you think about digital? digitizing that and automating it punching into it uh, in a in a more systematic way so that instead of getting a sample of you know your T&E, you're getting all of it. Instead of getting a sample of your contracts, you're getting all of it. And you can really look at it um, using AI and ML and just sort of, um, you know, sort of have a better um, feeling that you're on top of the risk of the company. And so that's kind of, um, you know, what, what GRC is. It's, it literally stands for governance, risk, and compliance. So the governance piece is um, sort of uh, uh, the, the products that we have are things like that we help companies manage their uh, entities and their subsidiaries and all the regulatory requirements around there. We help companies manage their boards of directors. On the risk and compliance side, that's the audit and the and SOX and third party risk um, and that kind of thing that we look at. And then we have a, a set of ESG and climate products as well. Um, and the company, as you said, I think you said, you know, we have, uh, you know, over 25,000 cu customers around the world. Um, we have uh, almost 800,000 board directors that use our product. So it's a really sort of, um, uh, we go from literally the highest parts of the company, um, the, the CEO and the, uh, the board of director down to folks that are on the ground, uh, you know, sort of doing the hard work of SOX and audit, uh, you know, in their respective departments. And, you know, the notion is, um, you know, we provide boards and leadership teams with the tools to run their run their companies and to and to have good governance for their companies. Um, you know, so it's uh, it really it really hits across the organization. The other thing that we've done quite a bit of work on, um, and I'm personally fairly passionate about, is you know, kind of on diversity and inclusion, um, helping companies just measure and monitor that, helping companies find board members that uh, that may be, uh, you know, helping make their their leadership teams more diverse. Um, you know, it's it's pretty amazing uh, the um, you know, the, the, the need to add women to boards um, is uh, is pretty I mean, dire when you look at the split of the workforce coming out of universities versus the split of the workforce that make it to that highest level of, of boards of directors. And, and that's one that I, I you know, I, I see personally, um, I sit on the board of Colgate Palmolive. So I sit on a publicly traded board and, um, 
you know, I think it's it's in 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 inherent uh, you know sort of obligation of of everyone in leadership to look around and say, how do we make this uh, a a more uh, you know a more holistic conversation? How do we make this a more diverse conversation? Fantastic. So you guys have a growth flywheel. Let's talk about that for a second. What is the company's growth flywheel? And how does it enable? How did it enable the company to grow so fast? Five hundred million in revenue. What are those ingredients? Let's hear dive into that for a second. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think the the, the first thing is product market fit. So, you know, if you don't have that, none of the rest of the stuff happens, and um, the. Uh, every company needs um, to be on top of their governance risk and compliance, right? So um, when you have the tailwind of saying there's a regulatory component to this, um, you've got to, uh, particularly if, even if you're a private company that thinks they may wanna go public someday, you've gotta sort of get your act together on the, the regulatory requirements and filings that you may have to do. So um, so that, that tailwind is only getting stronger if you look at things like ESG and um, you know, when Chairman Gensler came into the SEC uh, now, uh, God, uh, a year and a half ago, whenever it was, um, you know, the number one thing on his regulatory agenda was human capital matters and uh, and climate related matters as, as it impacts financials of, of companies. And so you look at the ESG stuff that we have around reporting and managing and monitoring uh, your climate, um, you know, your, your greenhouse gas emissions in particular, but also things like water waste, et cetera, recyclability, scopes one, two, and three. Um, when you look at that stuff, you say like, okay, there's a there's a deep need in the market for this stuff. So, so you know, you're not trying to uh, sell ice to Eskimos. You know, it's like a, um, you've got uh, you, you've got uh, that's probably not the right thing to say anymore, but um, you've got the um, you've got the tailwind of saying um, there is um, th there's a deep deep product need in the market. Um, you know, the other thing that I think creates a bit of virality to our product is that many board members are on um, multiple boards. And so they um, they use our product on one board, um, and then they're like the, these concentric circles start to overlap a little bit. So they say, "Hey, what about this?" When they go to a different board, and so that sort of um, if you look at every every board, you know, members often double boarded, um, then that kind of that kind of happens there. And then I think the last thing is, you know, there's just um, in terms of again some of the products around. Um, uh, you know, product need, you look at things like we have something that looks at third party risk and it specifically looks at sanctions lists and um, and politically affiliated parties. Well, the war in the Ukraine uh, sort of brought that to a head. That's always been out there that, by the way, that companies need to look for this and they need to make sure they're not doing business with sanctioned parties. Um, but I think, you know, overnight, it became very clear to a number of companies, hey, we've got to figure out like how we're accounting for this and how we're making sure that we're not on the wrong side of the regulatory stuff. And by the way, those regulations were different everywhere. They were different in Europe than they were in Canada, they were different in the United States. Uh, and so, you know, sort of making sure that 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 our uh, our customers could stay on top of those things uh, was super important. Um, so like when you think about all of those things and they come together, um, you've got the market need, you've got the market tailwinds. Um, and then I think there's a lot of execution to it, candidly. There is, you know, how do you hire and ramp the right salespeople, you know, and um, for a long time at sales at Salesforce, you know, I don't know if it's, I've, I've been out for now two and a half years, but I don't, so I don't know if it's still the case, but like in many ways we were gated only by the number of of uh, salespeople we could hire because you know you look at it and you say um, we have yet to top out the market and every time you know you always get salespeople saying like oh we can't hire any more salespeople you're going to cut my territory in half and like I'm not going to have enough they always manage to figure it out and uh, they're always turned out to be enough to you know enough to sell we were gated by the number of people we could put on the street with a bag to sell into into customers and so in many ways um, you know hiring salespeople when you have great 
product market fit um, is uh, is your gating factor. So bringing on salespeople, getting them ramped, having great enablement, teaching them the products, you know, getting their ramp time down from six months to four months to three months, um, you know, all those things are um, are you know velocity driving as it, as you look at um, you know how do you get product out in market and how do you grow the company. So and then of course like getting all the other stuff right, like what's the right support model? You know, do you, you know how many SDRs do you have? What how many sales engineers do you have? What is your customer success? I and mean, we have a ninety eight percent retention rate for our customers. So when you do not have a leaky bucket, growth is much easier. Um, you know, it is really hard if your retention rate is 80%. And every year, just before you even get started, you got to sell 20% to get back to where you started. Like that's a tough road to hoe. But when you say like, okay, like I'm, I'm basically like starting every year where I ended the last year and now everything on top of that is incremental, um, then, it, then it becomes much, much easier to, uh, you know, to grow the company. A few great things you said there. It's a large market that's not served. And, and this is a fantastic lesson for folks. The other thing you talked about, some level of inherent virality, because you're serving people who are probably leveraging the product to connect with each other, right? Yeah. They're they're all commenting in it. So when more than one person sees it, it then becomes inherently viral. But then those people are also on multiple boards, right? And that's something what even... Calendly did in, in in many ways. It's, Calendly is probably even more inherently viral because there's a lot of meetings per day. But if you look at Carta has a similar model, right? They sell to accountants and investors who then bring it to other companies and there's that loop going. But the one thing you talked about that people don't focus on enough is increasing retention. And uh, you know the focus on top line growth is empty calories if your customers are not engaged and they leave, right? It feels good, yeah. but it's not good for you. Right. No, it's, so, it's, I mean, it's, it's so important and it is so much easier to, uh, you know, retain a customer than it is to go, go sell a new customer. Um, and so many companies really under invest in it or under appreciate it, but really thinking through what is the model to take care of your customers, um, to, you know, and in a SaaS model, you know, resell them all the time because, uh, you know, the nature of the game is, you know, you can, you can, uh, you can take your toys and go to a new sandbox at, at some point. Um, and, you know, realistically, there is more stickiness to that. We always used to say at, at Salesforce, we always used to say like, we have to prove ourselves every time. We have to prove ourselves every year. The reality is it's hard to move a big implementation, but the, the, you know, the fact remains that, you know, they're not locked into having made multi-million dollar purchases up front of big software things that it took them three years to implement and go forward. It's really, um, you know, how do you, how do you keep those customers happy and how do you keep them on board? And then how do you execute on a land and expand strategy? So that's the other thing. Like if you have happy customers and you have a platform play and you have multiple um, uh, products hanging off of that platform, then you can sell them the next thing and the thing after that. And after you build trust, um, and, and you know, you can say, if you if you if you believe me over here, then trust me over here. And when they get that, and then when they see that there's connectivity between the, the pillars that sit on the platform and they can actually get more value out of, because of the fact that they have multiple products with you. Um, it really, um, you know, the strength of that is pretty amazing. Now, what are, what are the key traits of a retained customer? Like what are the things, ingredients that goes into it, right? A lot of people think, that I'm gonna sign a customer, they're gonna pay me a lot of money to sign a year contract, maybe multi-year contract. But then it's not about just signing them, you gotta support them, you gotta manage them, you gotta help grow them. Um, what are those levers or what, what does that uh, org look like and, and how does that go through a customer? What is the customer's life cycle at, at Diligent through your uh, support and, and service organization? How What lessons can we take? Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the, the big takeaways um, and, you know, every company at different stages has to figure this out for, um, you know, what the ratio, what the right ratio is for themselves. But if you um, sort of kind of handle it from a, um, you know, just a sort of a, a high level, um, I think the biggest mistake that companies make is they conflate 
customer support with customer success. And customer support, um, first of all, you know, the, the, in this day and age, the more digital that can be, the more self-serve that can be to sort of take away the annoying stuff and say, okay, let's just really make sure that the, the, the high value calls are going to humans uh, to, to handle. Um, on the customer support side. And then on the customer support side also, what is customer support doing to enable the rest of the business? Um, so it is, you know, the, nobody really wants to be sold when you call saying, I don't know, I, I need to help resetting my password. But, um, you know, creating awareness for the customer, the breadth of the product line, um, you know, creating uh, a, you know, kind of positive net promoter score where, you know, you're getting, uh, you know, the customer feels like they've been taken care of. That's all stuff that support can do. Then on the customer success side, in an ideal world, customer success is really more outbound. Um, you know, it is, uh, it's assigning to your usually highest value customers, but if you're lucky and have the, have the support model that, that you can fund, uh, maybe all of your customers, you know, but, uh, in various levels of, uh, of digital versus human and coverage models, um, but saying, you know, how do you work with a customer to say, tell me what your what what issues you're having and driving more value from their software. So you're not necessarily selling them more stuff. You're saying, hey, did you know you could do this? Did you know that um, the same software that you already bought can solve that problem over there? Maybe you're blocking out a competitor because they're not able to sell something in to solve that sort of point problem. Um, maybe you're just creating enough goodwill or enough value um, from your, your product that it does have that stickiness and it does stick in there for a long time. So, um, but it's really sort of that, um, that the difference between, um, uh, proactive and, um, uh, and, and reactive really is the difference between CS and, and customer support in some ways. Now, when you're scaling to a hundred million dollars and beyond, what are some barriers you've seen, the biggest barriers, and what are some enablers you've seen to scaling at that rate? Mm -hmm. You know, I think, um, you know, in many ways, we talked about products. Um, so I think, you know, there, there are products that get to, uh, you know, that, that get to that $100 million mark. And then it's like, okay, what, what next? Like, was it, is it a big enough market? So I think, you know, as you think about scale or as you think about starting a company or as you think about scaling a company, what's the town? Like, is there, is the market need out there? Um, and, you know, there's a little bit of a, a you know, a, a falsehood to that in that, Sometimes you grow the TAM by creating the by creating the product, and you know the TAM doesn't exist until you until you push into it. So I, I wouldn't say like you know uh, you know sort of adhere to that always, but um, but I think you know just making sure that the the, the market will support. Uh, you know, the level that you want to get to is, is obviously important first point. You got to have the people to do the job. And I think the interesting thing is, you know, you go through life cycles. It's super rare to see a founder um, who started at, uh, you know, started the company go to, um, you know, now it's a public company. Now it's a, um, you know, now it's a behemoth company. Um, you know, there's only a couple of examples. There's, you know, Larry Ellison, there's Mark Benioff, there's Bill Gates. Um, you know, there's, you know, there's those three. Um, but, um, but you can, I think, um, you know, sort of, you know, kind of change your view and change your scope. It just takes like, it's almost like, um, generations of a company. So, you know, what, what I think people forget is um, it's important to build a culture. And when you, um, when you get to a certain scale, you get to a hundred million, all of a sudden, like there's a lot more stuff that you need. There's a lot more process that you need. You've got a lot of people. Now you've got a lot of HR stuff. You got a lot of like, um, you know, needing to document and you can kind of wing it up to a certain point and a hundred million is probably past winging it, but you can, you can get away with a lot of stuff early on if you've got great product market fit, because you just, you're, you're just selling, you're just getting stuff out there. But then when you get to a certain point, 
you're hiring a tremendous amount of people to the to the salespeople thing I, I mentioned earlier. You're hiring so many people. You better have this stuff written down. Uh, you better have an enablement function. You better have uh, product documentation. Um, you know, you need to have um, more um, more process in place. And it, there's a point at which process is not a pain in the can for everybody. Cause like, you know, like the entrepreneurs among us, we all hate process to a certain extent. Uh, but at some point it's an enabling feature. If you don't have it, things will break and the wheels will come off. So how do you think about getting the right level of process in place that helps people do their job, that automates stuff, that uh, you know keeps you from having to throw human beings at problems where technology is more than you know more than able to solve it, and really sort of lets you focus on the things that are important for the business, focus on the development of the product, focus on the sales of the product, um, and really sort of um, you know doesn't let all that doesn't let all the stuff get in the way of doing that. And that's even things like, you know, like our product on GRC, like you don't want to have, uh, you don't want to have ethical or compliance issues pop up because you didn't write anything down and you didn't have a process. You didn't have a, a, a flow, any of that stuff. And, you know, we get companies all the time come to us and say like, Hey, we're on the verge of going public. And like, we got to, we got to have like all this stuff and, you know, I mean, we'll sell it to them, but it's like, you you should have started this like a year ago, right? Like, um, you know, you probably need, you know, you probably need to figure out stocks if you think you're going public. Um, so good luck with that. Um, you probably need to, uh, you know, start figuring out ESG. You probably need to have like board members and a board portal. So like, it's kind of entertaining in some ways to see, you know, the way, the way the scramble can happen for companies that are like, all of a sudden the lights come on and they go like, Oh no, like we got to figure this out. But, um, you know, I think, I think really like there is a way to do it all the way along the way where, you know, kind of at every, at every step function, and there, there are myriad step functions, and I can't tell you exactly where they are because they're different for every company. It might be a number like the 100 million mark. It might be when you go from, you know, you get over, you know, 200 employees and all of a sudden they're remote and you've got to figure out how to manage them and you've got to figure out how to, you know, inculcate new people into the culture and to keep the cultural thread strong if you believe that that's part of the magic of your company. So, like, how do you, um, especially in in a remote environment, how do you make sure that people feel a part of it and and how they have aligned passions? And you know, I think as a as a founder, that was the hardest thing for me when um, with like my company started to get bigger and bigger. Um, I was sort of like, for me, it was a passion. And for me, it was um, like, you know, I that's all I woke up every single day thinking about. But for some of the people that I hired three years in, like it was a job and it was a job they cared about and they were good at, but it was a job. And it was sort of for me, like being able to, to go, OK, like for them, it's a job and I need to align incentives and I need to, you know, get people uh, all pointed in the right direction. You know, that was a like that was a light bulb moment for me. Um, and but that's a scale thing. The people that you hire, your thousandth employee are not going to be as potentially as connected as your fifth employee, but your thousandth employee may have skills um, that they bring to the table, or they may have, you know, seen the movie before and know how the movie ends and be able to bring that knowledge to your company in a way that, you know, employee five, who this is the first job that they've ever had, and they have deep domain expertise, they know where every skeleton is, like they're both valuable, you just got to figure out how to, you know, bring them together in a way that's, you know, additive to the company. Certainly. And how do you maintain that though, right? Like as a leader, you abstract yourself. Let's say you're a founder, right? Your job, your first job is validating the market. Maybe you get five, 10 customers to pay you to try it out. You're, you're doing founder sales, you're bringing on customers, you're supporting, yeah. then you abstract one layer, maybe you hire a couple of people and you're a manager. Eventually you get to a point where truly you're, you are a CXO but you lose a little bit maybe of that love as you go from validation to product market fit to product channel fit to scale. How do you maintain that? How do you make sure that people are humming and aligned with the vision and mission? Maybe not as fast as you would do everything, but still rowing in that direction when you're not in the room. 
Yeah, you know, it's it's a great question. And I think that it's it's one of the things that if you can crack it, it it uh uh it, you know it, it can really pay dividends to the company. Um the way that, you know, one of the ways is just to really um be specific in articulating um you know what the mission of the company is where are you all going um ensure that everybody understands it um the way that uh the way that i have done it uh diligent um was um was borrowing from the salesforce playbook again um where um you know early in the in the in the history of salesforce uh, Mark and Parker uh, Harris sat down and and did the 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 first V two mom, which is vision, values, methods, obstacles, and measures. So it is, what do we want to achieve? Uh, you know, what are our core principles that we can fall back on to make sure that we can uh, achieve those? How are we going to do it? What are the methods by which we're going to get to that? What could get in our way? Those are the obstacles. And then how will we measure success? How do we know that we have achieved it? Um, and I have found that to be, you know, valuable enough to bring into Diligent. And so I do a V2 mom and then it scales down. Uh, everybody under me does their V2 moms. Um, and, you know, and, and then and and they all tie back. So my direct reports have um, have, you know, values and, and methods that are aligned to some of the things in my VT mom and the what that cascade or that waterfall of kind of vision values, methods, obstacles and measures does is it um, it sort of makes sure that, first of all, Everybody's, everybody knows what everybody else is responsible for, what they care about, what their core principles are as they try to get to those places. Um, so there's value just in that, in the transparency and the visibility into uh, you know, what everyone is trying to achieve. Um, then I think there is the, um, you know, it's funny, like you go through this exercise and um, you will have people, you know, maybe you have somebody who, um, you know, would have been on one of my old finance operations team, an account payable clerk. And they're like, well, like, I just process invoices. And it's like, no, like, you do. But uh, here's why that matters. Like what we care about, if if the, the CFO of the company cares about the cash conversion cycle, um, then what you're doing is helping to make sure that if we collect those things in a timely way, that um, that you will um, that you know you will positively contribute to that. And it's like people start to see the threads of no matter where they are in the organization, how that ties up to the top of the organization, how that ties up to where the company is going. And you know, I think it provides a um, a sense of commonality and a, a sense of common purpose that um, that, that helps bind people together. Um, and so that's sort of the way that, um, you know, that I've done it. You need to, you know, pay attention as you get larger to, you know, the importance of, of hiring the right people and having a good process around that. Um, you need to pay attention to, um, you know, the ongoing competitiveness of, you know, the, the product offering and things like that. There's a, you know, there's sort of the no brainer pieces of it, but then there's the, how do you just, how do you culturally align people uh, to, um, you know, to, to be all rowing in the same direction, as you said, and, um, and do that in a way that, you know, makes it easy for people to understand what's going on with their company. So a big part of, uh, of your leadership style, I understood and heard is asking provocative questions. What are pro maybe an example of provocative question and uh, how do you do that? So you not only stir debates and resolve problems, but also don't come across as a jerk. <laughs> well, maybe it's because uh, maybe it's because I was not a uh, a, uh, a technical uh, undergrad. I was uh, I was at Stanford. I was a fuzzy of the techs and fuzzies. Uh, so I did international relations. Um, although, had I known that industrial engineering existed, I would have been an I would have been uh, an IE major. But um, the um, you know I, I I think like potentially as a result that I fall back on a little bit more Socratic method and a little bit helping people get to the answer themselves. Um, and even when I, you know, even when I am sort of, um, uh, 
you know, pushing on a topic, um, I may phrase it as help me understand, or, you know, uh, I'm not clear on, uh, on why this is important. Like, let's talk about this. Um, and so I think there's, there's ways to, uh, to be provocative without, you know, kind of being up in somebody's grill all the time and being able to say, um, you know, uh, you know, I, I need to understand why, why this is happening and show me, uh, show me how to do this. You know, that said, um, I do think that, um, you know, we, we hear a lot about, um, you know, diversity and inclusion. We hear a lot about, um, sometimes the blowback in Silicon Valley to diversity and inclusion. I think one of the biggest benefits of diversity, and I'm not talking just having a woman at the table or having a person of color at the table, I'm talking about having differences of thought is I think one of the things that can happen, especially if you're in a hyper um, successful company that's growing fast, that's doing really well, is, um, you know, people say, you know, that you get you get a sort of, um, you know, a, a yes culture of um you know, just like whatever, whatever the CEO says, whatever I say, people go do. And it's like, no, 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 I want you to pressure test this. I might be throwing out ideas and I, and I want you to ask me why I want you to, um, you know, to give me the other side of the argument. I may still do what I want to do. And I may still like have conviction around the fact that's the right thing to do. But at least if I have asked the, my team to say like, what could go wrong? Uh, tell me, tell me what's, you know, where the holes are, at least I I can then say, okay, there's an opportunity to look at the potential risks and to mitigate some of those risks um, or to be prepared for, for some of those risks. So I think having, um, you know, the dialogue that creates um, a culture where people will raise their hand and say, like, I don't get it. Like, why would we do this? Or to say like, hey, that I think, I think something completely different um, is really important. And the, and, and, and one of the ways to do that is through provocative questions. So it might just be things like, like, you know, you just sold the team on, hey, this is an amazing idea that we're going to go do. And then it's like, okay, well, like, let's just project forward a year and this project failed. Why'd it fail? Like, let's go through, we're now going to do a postmortem on this project that just failed what happened. And if you do that, you can sort of go like, oh, like, I, I see a big hole that I didn't see before, as opposed to blindly plowing forward and saying, like, nothing could go wrong. It's perfect. Like, everything's perfect. It's great. Um, so I think it's just really, it's it's like an approach and a tone and an openness to saying, um, you know, I don't have all the answers. That's why I like, I, that's why I have a team. If I had all the answers, I wouldn't need a team, right? Like, um, you know, I, I expect people to challenge and, uh, you know, to bring things forward based on their experience or based on, you know, my team is closer to their teams than I am, like by definition. So they're going to be able to surface some of those things that I wouldn't necessarily see. Me. Now, as a CEO of such a big company, what goals do you set for yourself and recommend other CXOs, whether a startup or large company, set for themselves? How do you define yeah. and measure success? Well, I think it's, you know, it's different for every industry and it's different, you know, CXO is super broad. Like, so uh, for a COO, it's probably growth um, uh, for lots of, for lots of C-levels at, um, at companies sort of, you know, under a billion dollars in sales, I would say it's, it's usually going to be growth. Um, but, you know, in, in, uh, in the current environment, there's things like employee retention, there's things like productivity um, and, um, and there's lots of uh, sort of contributing factors, but I would say um, growth solves a lot of sins. Um, you know, uh, when you are, when the growth flywheel is going, you can, uh, there's, there's a lot of things that you can fund. There's a lot of things, that, a lot of mistakes that you can make and recover from. Um, it's really when, uh, when that slows down, that is harder. So if I had to pick one, I would say, you know, get the, get the growth engine going, um, but it's going to be different for every industry and every, you know, a CFO is going to have a different set of challenges uh, than a CEO, than, you know, had a product, right? I love that growth fixes everything. And that is true. A lot of, I mean, if you have high retention, growth fixes everything because retention without, I mean, growth without retention, like you said early on, could make it worse even, Yeah. right? 
Now, yeah. a lot of what a company is, is the people, right? People build companies, not the other way around. How do you ensure that you have the right talent as you scale to 100 million and beyond? Yeah, you know, it's gotten, um, it's, it's, it's been so interesting uh, over the last couple of years. I would say, you know, it's, uh, it was a war for talent, then it was a war for retention, uh, you know, trying to keep people in seat uh, during the pandemic. And now there's a little bit of a shift in the market where it does feel like it's getting a little easier to hire again and to get great talent. But I think there's a couple of, you know, a couple of things. It is, um, uh, I have always, you know, I've always been open to um, finding the right person um, and thinking through what are the core things that I have to have versus uh, what are the things that are the nice to have. And I'll I'll give you an example. Um, You know, when I was hiring a CIO uh, for Salesforce, um, I, uh, you know, I I went to the recruiter and I said, all right, I've got to have someone who has done this before at scale because like the CIO job at Salesforce is a nightmare because there's there's literally, you know, 40,000 people that think they know how to do their job better than you. So, um, so like, and are not afraid to, to call you up and tell you. So, you know, somebody has done this at a technology firm at scale with hyper growth, with a big Salesforce implementation. And I got back all these candidates and I was like, uh, you know, well, first of all, I said, I'd asked for a balanced slate. I'd asked for a Rooney rule and, uh, and I didn't get one. Um, I got, you know, just a, a bunch of people from Silicon Valley and I said, okay, well, I, I did say that I want you to find, uh, you know, put some women on the slate, at least. I'm not saying that I'm going to hire the best candidate, but I want to talk to more people. Um, And they said, look, you gave us these requirements that said they had to do that, like they had to look like this. And that's what we gave you. And I said, all right, well, let's change it up. I said, uh, I need them to be uh, experts in technology. I need them to, them to have been, have proven innovation. I need them to have done this in a big company. And I need them to have a giant Salesforce implementation. So that opened it that opened it wide open. And I ended up hiring this woman. I brought her in and I, I put her on the interview slate. And I had literally every single person that she had to interview with called me up and said, I cannot believe you're making me talk to the lady from the railroad. And I said, like, I am just talk to her. And uh, she ended up being the longest tenured CIO at Salesforce. She ended up uh, she ended up being number one on everybody's interview slate um, of all the people that we had spoken to. Um, literally, there's not a single person that didn't put her at the top of the list. And um, and it was like it was my own blindness on the definitions that I set for those people. So I think that is, um, you know, that's one thing is be open to, you know, where the talent is and think about the fungible skills and the especially in this market where there's so many people in technology, there's so many um you know, there's there's such a need um, for people like, how do I grow people into this? And, you know, I also fall back a little bit on, um, you know, at something I learned at my very first job out of business school, which was at Bain, um, when we hired people, uh, they would say, don't hire an analyst, you can't be a partner. And, you know, it, some part of you goes like, oh, come on, man, I just need someone who knows math. Like, I, I don't I don't need a partner like that's 15 years from now. Like, I don't have to deal with this. And um, but there's some logic to it. Right. There's some logic to saying, um, all right, hire somebody who's good at math, but also hire somebody who, you know, either has or can grow into the people skills needed to manage client relationships, because like that'll, by the way, not just get them to partner, that'll get them to senior associate or that'll get them to whatever. And so, you know, thinking through, like, how do you hire people who have some core skills that um, where they can grow with the company? Um, you're always going to have to add um, as you as you scale, and you're always going to have to make tough calls about replacing people who have sort of reached the Peter principle of you know they've reached the limit of 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 their skill set uh, or you know the jobs that they can do. Um, And oftentimes, honestly, those can be conversations that um, they're hard, but they can be conversations of like, look, you're super valuable to the company. 
um, you no longer should have the scope that like this because the, the the scope of what you do is now 10 times the size of, of what, what it was when you started doing it. So now we need you to do this part of it. We need to do this little pillar. And that happens all the time in uh, in companies, but I think it's particularly, you know, um, it, it can be a little painful, right? Like it can be like, we have, we have grown past where, um, you know, you can make a contribution here. And sometimes it's when you bring somebody from outside that has done it before. Like there's like there's no point in reinventing the wheel on certain functions that are, you know, there's just a right way to do them. Um, so sometimes bringing people in from outside can refresh that a little bit and, um, and just make the company stronger. So I think it really depends on, um, you know, on, on, you know, the, the individual needs of, you know, what you're looking for. But I think it is, you know, a couple of core principles around be open to thinking through what skills are fungible, be open to hiring people who um, can, can grow with the company. Like it may not, they may be, maybe they're not a perfect expert in this one small narrow area, but if you think of it as, you know, but if, if they were to grow their career, they'd be in a broader set. Could they handle that? And then thinking through what is the right time to have the difficult conversations around uh, when somebody is has outgrown um, their scope a little bit, and um, you know, it, it, even just going from as I, you know, the 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 you know, there's five functions under you to go now. There's one function under you. That one function might still be twice the size of what they had two years ago if your company is growing really fast, right? So um, so it's really, um, I, I think a couple of core principles like that on, um, you know, sort of finding the right people, taking care of the right people, having a culture that will retain the right people um, and and grow them in their in their jobs um, is, is, is sort of what I would say. I love it. And maybe summarized, I, I have this quote, if you keep promoting people based on tenure versus trajectory, you will become the very thing you set out to disrupt. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to take some audience questions um, because we're running close to the top of the hour. This has been a great discussion. Thank you so much for joining us. Of course. If it would be good to learn about the ratio of CSM to sales team and percent of customers and any other tips in that nature in terms of um, sales to success yeah. driving towards that 98% retention? Yeah, what I would say is it's gonna be different for every company. Um, so we did have these ratios uh, at Salesforce. I do have them at Diligent. Um, they're different between the two. Um, you know, I think it, it, here's some of the things that you think about when you look at it. Um, we, you know, how many um, are, are you selling into enterprise, first of all? Because if you're selling into enterprise, they may have a higher touch model. And frankly, they may be willing to pay for a higher touch model. So they may say, I want a premium support model where I have sort of an individual that I can call. Um, so, um, so enterprise would be one, the nature of the product would be another. Like, is it a simple product that you can install and it's a matter of pinging the customer occasionally to make sure that they're still happy and being able to, uh, to do that in a way that isn't necessarily selling every time you have an interaction with them. So, um, so things like that. And then I think there is, um, you know, there is a model, um, for more of SMB or more um, sort of um, lighter lighter weight products, where you could say it's a largely digital touch model, but it's still a digital touch. Like there's still a way, and there's still at the end of the day a human somewhere that's thinking about how do we make our customers more successful? How do we make our products stickier? How do we increase um, product usage? And you know that may be things like tracking, you know, Mao Dao, etc. Um, how do we um, how do we think about um, the expansion flywheel and whether or not uh, our customers are expanding at the rate that we would expect them to um, and, uh, and and you know creating opportunities for other products so you know, like like all the other ratios in a go to market strategy, like you know, companies are going to have different SDR ratios. Companies are going to have um, different SE ratios. Like a company that has a highly technical implementation, or a you know, what some of our products are 
are pretty wonky. They're pretty like, you know, they're for auditors. They're built by auditors for auditors. Like we need to have people that are they're sort of technical experts who can talk about, you know, um, regulatory stuff and how you deal with that. And um, in addition to being able to really do sort of the killer demo, right? So um, so, so it, it's going to depend a little bit on um, the nature of your product, the nature of your customer. Um, what I would say is over time, you can sort of tweak those things to get them right. And you can experiment a little bit. So you can say, um, you know, if you're going to market geographically um, and you've got a, you know, a West and an East, you can say like, well, let's like, let's play with it a little and see if we can juice sales a little bit by adding more SDRs or adding more CSMs uh, on the East Coast. Okay, that seems to work. Like, let's replicate it over there. So you can sort of, um, you can play with, um, you can play with teams like that and sort of figure out what the right, uh, what the right sort of set of set of ratios are for your company. I can't, I can't give it to, I can't give it to you without knowing more. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But that's at least a good framework to think about it, right? Like how you're supporting. And then, you know, over time you'll realize that you're dropping the ball, right? You got to test it. Like if you have a support uh, or or a customer success person, that person's job is onboarding and making sure there's upsell, cross-sell, but beyond that, customers are being retained. And after a certain set of customers, you'll just realize that ball, the ball is being dropped. You can't burn people out. And, right. and that ends up becoming your number. And then through enablement, you see how much farther you can go. But uh, you can't, uh, at the enterprise level, you can't put an infinite number of, of uh, customers to one CS rep. Now, there is another question here from Lorenzo. Um, companies are bought, not sold. And I appreciate that. Any advice to position position ourselves to a company like IBM from an M and A perspective? What I guess learnings you had from yeah. selling your company? Um, well, having done partners and alliances at uh, at three companies now at Visa, at Salesforce, and I built I'm building up a partnership uh, motion at Diligent. I would say one of the things that um, you know you should be aware of is that phenomenon that I talked about with. Uh, selling my company to IBM, which was, you know, oftentimes these things start with familiarity and they start with partnerships. And um, there's a couple of, uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. You know, the, obviously they're able to see how the products come together. They're able to see if there's a mutual customer need for a specific product. Um, so I think that's, um, that's always an interesting way in. The other great thing about partnerships, by the way, is if you have somebody come in over the top, sort of out of the blue and say, hey, we want to make an offer for your company. We want to buy you. It's good to be able to dial a friend. And it's good to be able to say like, hey, let's call up those people we've been partnering with and say, by the way, we're getting an inbound offer uh, before we sign an exclusive, you know, uh, uh, letter um, is, you know, is, is there, is there a process that, that, you know, we should talk about given that, you know, this company and we're, you know, we're a known quantity and there's a known product fit with, with the way that your product works. And so I would say that's, uh, you know, that's one of the, the key ways that's certainly how I got into uh, IBM. IBM's a little funky in that they actually make uh, their leaders, at least they did when my company was sold to them, they make their leaders actually sign up for and add the number from the deal model to their number for the year, which is brutal because, you know, you're trying to go like, it's going to be worth everything. And, uh, and then somebody on the other side has to sign up and say like, yeah, I'm going to add that number to my number and make that for the year uh, and tie my comp to it. So um, that may be why they don't do as many acquisitions as, as some of the others. But, um, but yeah, I would say, Look at look at partnerships and and uh, and alliances in that case, and and see where you have commonality already. Definitely it takes a, you you got to build the relationship. So when you need it, they're there. Versus you know um, uh, you're asking for a favor kind of thing. You build it's a relationship. All not, yeah, yeah. Not only with partners, but with the press. Like who all are talking about you. Uh, effectively, everything is a partnership. So yeah. that's some great advice. Now, as you look back at your career, what was the toughest, lowest point of your journey and how did you navigate it? Oh, uh, you know, um, 
I think, uh, I, well, first of all, I have, you know, I have a career. Everyone always says like, you know, uh, how did you get from point A to point B? And the usual answer is I have no idea. Um, there are, you know, there are common threads that go through, but oftentimes I was going to work for somebody that I respected or where in a situation that I thought I could learn. Um, you know, as I think about the low points, you know, probably the low point for me was, um, uh, you know, when I was, I, I was at my second startup at, at Value Bond, um, and that was the one that we sold the night capital. Um, I, I moved back to California. My dad was dying of cancer and just trying to balance, um, you know, the wanting to spend time with my dad and trying to run a company, uh, which was often, uh, you know, bringing me to New York was really hard. And, um, you know, just, uh, it was, it was, it was a super tough time in my life. It was, you know, it was work related. It was personal related, um, and balancing the two. Um, and I've just historically always been terrible at work-life balance. So it's just a, it's an ongoing challenge that I, that I try to work with. Now it's very rare, right. And I, and I want to call this out. It's very rare for women to be in C-level exec positions. Although we did our traction comps last week and 60% of the C-suite were women, mm -hmm. but it's not, it's, it's, it's gotten better and better. What lessons you've learned from your journey that can serve as an inspiration to other women in the workforce who are looking to advance their careers and step into executive positions? Yeah, I mean, you know, first of all, I think it's um, it's 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 odd when we say um, there are not more, you know, women in leadership positions. Women graduate at a greater percentage from college than men do. Specifically, materially more, sixty percent of college graduates are women. Um, so you would expect uh, that that would filter up and become, uh, you know, like sixty percent of leadership, sixty percent of boards of directors. That's not where we are. But I think one of the things that you know, I try to be super. Um, uh, you know, I feel like I'm in a position of, um, of a little privilege now where, um, you know, I can try to set an example. I can try to make it easier, um, you know, whereas, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, I might have snuck out the back door if I had a personal appointment or something with my kid or something. Now I just say, like, I've got to go. I've got to go. Like my kid is like, you know, doing the school play. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take off and it's three in the afternoon. Um, and I think sort of clearing the way for some of those things is one thing. Um, I also think just, you know, diversity begets diversity in an interesting way. Like that, that example that I gave you of uh, the CIO at Salesforce, um, you know, it, it was a highly male sales for uh, or a highly male uh, uh, IT department when she came in. Um, miraculously, uh, lots of women wanted to come work for a woman CIO. And, uh, you know, by the time she left, it was a far more diverse organization. So, you know, I think um, some of the, um, you know, some of the movement to try to get more diversity in leadership teams can pay off in ways that you don't even expect in terms of, you know, recruiting retention and simply just providing the model by which people go like, oh, I get it. Like I can be successful at this company. Like if she did it, I think I can do it. And there is something to, if you see it, you can be it, um, that I, I think we shouldn't discount. Um, and, um, and, and it, it makes a difference. One piece of unconventional advice to close this out that founders and leaders ignore, but shouldn't. You know, I don't know how unconventional it is because I've heard it before and this is not my line, but I do think like hiring people that are smarter than you um, and not being afraid of hiring people that are smarter than you. I have a super smart team. They're awesome. Um, you know, back to that work-life balance. You're not going to have any work-life balance if you're doing all the work. So, um, you know, thinking through not being intimidated by uh, by bringing on resources that, uh, you know, are truly going to crush it and, and do an amazing job. Um, and I, I think far too many people still still are, have a little fear of that. You know, What's what's interesting is if you're insecure about your own personal um, growth versus uh, the growth of the company, you may go far, uh, or you may go fast. You may not go far. Uh, you may not go long, right? Because yep. you're going to mentally burn out. And uh, and what I've seen is the best leaders hire people who are smarter than them, and they build companies, right? Uh, people build companies. It's not a what is it? Single player game. It's a team sport. Yes. So I think that is, that is really, really important. Thank you so much for joining us. It was a great pleasure. I learned a ton. This is going to be on our YouTube 
It's going to be on our podcast. Folks, tune in. We also dropped all the recordings from our Traction Comp sessions on our YouTube, and they're already at thousands of views in less than a day. So check out our Traction Comp YouTube, hit subscribe, and hit the bell icon. Thank you for joining us, Lisa, again, and have a wonderful weekend. Thanks, you too. I need some traction. You need some traction.